Managing your law practice can be challenging. Marketing, time management, attracting clients, and all the things besides the cases that you need to do that aren't billable. Welcome to this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. This is where you'll get the information you need from expert guests and host Christopher Anderson, here on Legal Talk Network. Welcome to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast, helping attorneys achieve more success. We're glad you can listen today on the Legal Talk Network. I am your host, Christopher Anderson, and I'm an attorney with a singular passion for helping other lawyers be more successful with their law firm business. My team at How to Manage a Small Law Firm and I work directly with lawyers across the country to help them achieve success as they define it. In the Unbillable Hour, each month we explore an area important to growing revenues, giving you back more of your time, and or improving your professional satisfaction in one of the key areas of your business. I start with the fundamental premise that a law firm business exists primarily to provide for the financial, personal, and professional needs of you, its owner. In this program, I have a chance to speak to you as I do in presentations across the country about what it takes to build and operate your law firm like the business that it is. I have a chance to introduce you to a new guest each month to talk about how to make that business work for you instead of the other way around. Before we get started, I do want to say a thank you to our sponsors, Answer One, Solo Practice University, and Scorpion. Answer One is a leading virtual receptionist and answering services provider for lawyers. You can find out more by giving them a call at 800-ANSWER-1 or online at www.answerone.com. That's www.answer, then the number one, dot com. Solo Practice University is a great resource for solos no matter how long you've been practicing. Make sure you check out solopracticeuniversity.com and learn how to run your practice better. Scorpion crushes the standard for law firm online marketing with proven campaign strategies to get attorneys better cases from the internet. Partner with Scorpion to get an award-winning website and ROI-positive marketing programs today. Visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast. And today's episode of the Unbillable Hour is blockchain. One of the topics that I cover is, is production and operations in your law firm. And uh, the, the operations is what is the second promise of every law firm. You know, the law firm does two basic things. They sell legal services and they deliver legal services. And Joshua Lennon has been kind enough to uh, join us here today to talk about blockchain and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and how this stuff that most lawyers I'm willing to bet haven't really heard of or at least have no real understanding is about to impact the practice of law and the business of law. So Joshua, welcome. Hi, it's great being here, Chris. I'm Joshua Lennon, the lawyer in residence at Clio. Yes, and uh, what, what does the lawyer in residence at Clio do? So it's a, a really unique position. Clio recognized back in 2012 that they needed legal scholarship to help them really understand their audience and to build the best software for lawyers. So they asked me to join their team and I've been working alongside them ever since. Fantastic. All right, so I watched your presentation yesterday on blockchain and Bitcoin. It was mm -hmm. really fascinating because I, I think I have, I'm beginning to see what you see, which is that this is going to have an impact on the business of law. It definitely um, is. And, uh, and that, that lawyers need to start understanding at least enough of it that they can take the right actions or hire someone to take the right actions, but not be clueless when this comes down the pike. That's absolutely the case. I think it's a technology, and just like any other technology, lawyers need to learn the competent benefits and risk of that technology as per their ethical duties. But it's also a really interesting thing that it can impact their finances as well. And so I think that should make lawyers doubly interested. Yeah, and you, I think like the two areas that you talked about yesterday that kind of certainly piqued my interest as an attorney who's not practicing right now, but you know, how it would impact their businesses, were, um, first of all, obviously cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. One that everybody or most people know about is Bitcoin. There are, I think you indicated, a thousand other ones? Or? There are at least 900 known cryptocurrencies that are being traded right now on the internet. Wow. And then the other one, which I hadn't really thought of, but that blockchain also enables, is the authentication of everything, but documents, audio files, videos, but uh, that it could be or is being used and, and could be used much more widely to have an ability to really have complete authentication as to a digital file. That's absolutely the case. And not just a digital file, but who accesses that file, who has permissions to access that file, the usage of that file after it's been released. Pretty much anything that you could kind of write down as a note can be tracked on a blockchain in a way that is unalterable 
and therefore a sound authentication method in many instances. And so what I understood from what you were explaining, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what blockchain is, but what kind of struck me is blockchain, in a sense, isn't, right? There's no central blockchain storage facility. Blockchain is mm -hmm. distributed. How does that really work? What, what is blockchain? So blockchain's really just a software method for storing records. And it can be used to store any type of record. So value, which is what's being recorded, is a cryptocurrency. But it could, as we've talked about, be used to store authentication of certain details. Now how it works is there is a distributed network, and it depends on how the particular blockchain is set up. But in that network, everybody is processing transactions on the ledger at the same time. And they are basically compressing them and storing them as an address or a hash. And then once you get enough of those together, they become this block that's added continuously mm -hmm. to this chain of information. So hence the blockchain. But what's very interesting about it is we've been operating this model of cloud computing for about the last 15 years where we put all of our information on a server on the other side of the internet. But right, we, we right. know kind of where the server is. With blockchain, we don't because it's being shared concurrently with hundreds, possibly thousands of processors all contributing processing power at the same time. It's not a new concept, but this use, especially enabled by software, is very, very powerful. And so if someone tries to tamper with a contract, tamper with a photograph, tamper with an audio file, or change the content of their Bitcoin, then the authentication gets broken in some way? Well, the authentication just doesn't happen because the processors will take a look at the previous records in the chain leading up to this moment, and they'll see a discontinuity. Okay. And so what will happen is you'll have a, a failure to authenticate, and the transaction just can't go forward. So it's a way of kind of enforcing trust based on past actions in a way that we've never had before. And to your knowledge, is this authentication, this method of enforcing trust, is this being accepted in courts as, a, as an authentication method? Absolutely, we've seen two states already alter their laws to accommodate blockchain authentication. So Vermont has changed the rules of evidence to allow for it to authenticate any document. And Arizona has actually enabled blockchain to act as an e-signature. Wow. with a lot of contracts there. So there are changes happening right now with the law authenticating blockchain usage. Really cool. So we're going to take a break here for a second and we'll come right back and we'll talk about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and how they relate to blockchain. What do they have to do with each other? Ready to create and build your own solo or small firm practice? Need a nuts and bolts education on the 360 degree experience of starting a business? There's only one online destination dedicated to helping you achieve your goals. Solo Practice University, the only online educational and professional networking community dedicated to lawyers and law students who want to go into practice for themselves. More than 1,000 classes, 58 faculty and mentors. What are you waiting for? Check out solopracticeuniversity.com today. Is your firm experiencing missed calls, empty voicemail boxes, and potential clients you'll never hear from again? Enter Answer One virtual receptionists. They're more than just an answering service. Answer One is available 24 7. They can even schedule appointments, respond to emails, integrate with Clio, and much more. Answer One helps make sure your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800 Answer One or visit them at answerone.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. Feel like your marketing efforts aren't getting you the high value cases your firm deserves? For over 15 years, Scorpion has helped thousands of law firms just like yours attract new cases and grow their practices. As a Google Premier Partner and winner of Google's Platform Innovator Award, Scorpion has the right resources and technology to aggressively market your law firm and generate better cases from the internet. For more information, visit scorpionlegal.com forward slash podcast today. And we're back with Joshua Lennon, the lawyer in residence at Clio. We've been talking about blockchain. And what I wanted to do after the break now is talk about Bitcoin as a sort of proxy for all the cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. But let's just start with what in the heck is a cryptocurrency? So a cryptocurrency is basically translating fiat currency, so dollars mm -hmm. that we have in our pockets, into a, a stored digital value. 
Now, digital values are not a new thing, right? We've got credit card balances right. and bank account balances that we access via the internet. But once it becomes distributed, there's really nobody backing it up like you have with fiat currency. There's not the federal treasury, right. for example, like backing up the US dollar. So it becomes a, a shared value that is almost literally created out of nothing. We've just decided that a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin can hold value and today it's worth about $3,000 per Bitcoin. Yeah, I guess the, as with any property in the world, the value is what a reasonable person is willing to sell it for and a reasonable person is willing to buy it for. Yeah. And right now today what you're saying is that on the internet, I can go buy a Bitcoin and the reasonable sellers are willing to sell me one for about $3,300. Yeah, and I think you've raised a, an interesting point that it's property. So what we've seen legally speaking is both courts and regulatory agencies are treating cryptocurrencies as property, not kind of fiat currency. And so they operate under a different legal regime. So the IRS, for example, counts cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin as property. And so therefore, you have to pay taxes on the value earned by possessing a Bitcoin. And just like you were holding a stock certificate, you have a capital gains tax. We see the bankruptcy courts are treating it as property. So okay. they'll take a look at the valuation growth over time. Like, what was it when you purchased it? What is it now? How does that apply to the estate and the trustee's valuation of it? And we're seeing this come more and more into play in kind of personal legal matters, like marriages, sure. where at least one party will have a Bitcoin or maybe attempting to hide marital assets in Bitcoins or in estates where people unfortunately pass on and their descendants now have, um, or their heirs, their <laughs> heirs uh, might have to figure out what to do with these digital currencies that are now a part of the estate. First of all, you described it as property and so like any other property, first of all, its relationship to dollars, mm -hmm. what you can buy or sell one can go up and down, up right? Up and down, absolutely. Um, so it's a, it's a speculative kind of property, uh, mm -hmm. just, just like any other. And it's enabled by this blockchain so that what you hold is authenticated by the blockchain technology. Is Absolutely right? right. You can hold any value of Bitcoins that have been created and have been traded for value elsewhere. So I could have one Bitcoin, I could have a thousand Bitcoins, I could have 1.89 Bitcoins. Okay. So the value is really kind of interesting that it can be broken up like that. Can I have Pi Bitcoins? I think Technically, yes, <laughs> but some computer somewhere is screaming in pain right now. <laughs> well, that would be irrational. No. Um, so, that way I think we have at least a basic understanding. Bitcoins are a storage of value. Yes. Authenticated by blockchain. Blockchain transactions. One thing I know about dollars in my pocket is that there is at least someone who has control over where the more are created, yes. which can affect the value of the dollar in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Who controls how many Bitcoins are created? So that depends on the blockchain, but in Bitcoin's instance, there is an algorithm that guides the creation of Bitcoins. And so what they're trying to do is create a, a little bit of artificial scarcity. So that way there aren't too many Bitcoins and we can somewhat estimate the market value of them. And how Bitcoins are created is through a process called mining, where people are processing both the blockchain transactions as well as an algorithm that was created at the time the Bitcoin blockchain was created. And it kind of just finds Bitcoins. And because these people are contributing computing resources, they are assigned a Bitcoin that is created every now and then. At the beginning, it was very easy to create a Bitcoin, but now we're seeing scarcity start to happen. Okay, and so there's no chairman of the Bitcoin Fed or anybody else who can like say, oh, I want to go uh, fly to Fiji uh, so I'm going to print me some Bitcoins. There's no, Absolutely nobody that can not, do that. yeah. But that is why we've seen other cryptocurrencies being created, is that scarcity is actually encouraging people to create new and different forms of cryptocurrency and ways of storing value. Got it. All right, we're going to take another break here, and when we come back, we're going to talk about what Bitcoins mean to law firms. How is it really going to impact the practice of law? Hi, this is Bob Ambrogi. I've been writing, podcasting, and speaking about legal technology for over two decades. Monica Bay and I co-host a show called Law Technology Now, where we interview experts behind the newest legal tech. Tune in on iTunes, Stitcher, or at LegalTalkNetwork.com to learn why technology is improving the legal industry for lawyers, their clients, and everyone, as it brings us closer to access to justice for all. All right, we're back with Joshua Lennon, the lawyer in residence at Clio, and we're going to wrap up our talk about blockchain and Bitcoin by getting to the point, basically, which is, 
what do lawyers need to know? How is Bitcoin going to really come to impact the practice and business of law? Well, given that there are at least 3 million Americans possessing Bitcoin right now, the odds are sooner rather than later you're going to see Bitcoins come into your law firm. So I think the most important aspect for a law firm is to understand that it is mostly treated as property. Right. And so just like any other property, you can accept it as payment, but we're starting to see some special guidance come forward from bar associations, regulators, on how law firms should handle Bitcoins as payment. And just like any other payment, it can't be unreasonable for the service provided. Sure. So in guidance from Nebraska, for example, they said, go ahead and take the Bitcoin, but immediately convert it back into a fiat currency. Turn it back into dollars. Which I found interesting, right? Because if I paid in a chicken, I don't have to You don't have to go out and sell the chicken. The chicken right? Yeah. Um, I can eat the chicken, or I can yeah. keep the chicken, or I can keep the eggs the chicken makes. But mm -hmm. at Bitcoin, they're saying, convert it. Convert it, yeah. Uh, because it is, the value of them are fluctuating quite wildly right now. There's a little bit of a, I think, a frothy bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse my language. So it could be that it's in the lawyer's best interest to convert it right away, because then you at least know the value that you're holding. So rather than taking a Bitcoin, and then the value drops 10%, right. you lose 10% of your fee, this way you've got a fixed amount. And then you can also deposit fiat currencies in your trust account, and you can't do that with a Bitcoin. So again, it's another protection method for you. Right, mm -hmm. right, yeah. So yeah, because you, for instance, yeah, because if somebody gives you property, you do still have a duty of safekeeping. Exactly. And I guess if you're going to be converting it and storing it in dollars, and you're holding it for the client, then you probably need to let them know, because yeah. they are also losing out or gaining, depending on which way the Bitcoin moves. That's true. Now, importantly, that guidance is only if you're holding it for the payment of legal fees. Got it, okay. So if you're just holding it in trust, like say it's a, an asset in dispute in a divorce, then the guidance we're seeing is hold it as a Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency, but advise the client that the value still is in fluctuation. And so right. just because they're holding one Bitcoin doesn't mean they're holding $3,000. Right. Yeah. And of course, you do have to take the proper steps to keep it secure. And so in this instance, it's making sure you understand the technology behind it, that you're preventing people from being able to access the Bitcoin, and that could be through use of encryption or special software tools. And once you do that, then it's perfectly reasonable for a law firm to hold Bitcoins in trust. Excellent, so yeah, the two big key things to think about for a law firm is one, how to accept it as Bitcoin as payment. Yes. And you said Nebraska's come out with rules on that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess we're going to be waiting. A lot of states are going to be chiming in. There's probably going to be differences, and we're going to have to finally have a model rule, I imagine. Absolutely. I think that's going to become part of the practice of law. But I think we can already accommodate that with our uh, rules on unconscionable fees sure. and on securing property for our clients. Right. Yeah, the I models mean, already exist. Exactly. I just have to. This is. This is really no different than, let's say, a stock. Uh, some lawyers do take stock in payment, right? Absolutely, and, right. And yeah. that's very volatile as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is holding it in trust. And lawyers need to, and I think that's a key one for this discussion because, you know, some lawyers might say, nobody's ever asked me to hold, take a Bitcoin as payment, and I can always say no. Yes. But we can't always say no when we're involved in a family law case, we're involved in a criminal case, we're involved in a business dispute, mm -hmm. and there's a Bitcoin becomes part of what's in dispute. And we have procedures for what to do with property. We can't put a Bitcoin in the registry of the court. No. So we're going to have to, lawyers are going to have to know what to do with it. That's absolutely it. And there are some simple tools out there called wallets mm -hmm. that will make it easy to securely store Bitcoins and other types of cryptocurrencies. And so it's really easy to hop on the web, research wallets. Uh, one that we recommended in our talk this week was jax.io. So that's J A X X. .io, okay. which is being produced out of Toronto, Canada, and a great lawyer who practices in Bitcoin law up there, Addison Cameron Huff, highly recommended it to me. Okay, well great, that's a great recommendation for our listeners. And that is uh, where we're out of time. I, think I could go on with this. Uh, and that wraps up this edition of the Unbillable Hour, the Law Business Advisory Podcast. Our guest today, again, has been Joshua Lennon, the lawyer in residence at Clio. Joshua, if people want to know more about this, how might they get in touch with you or do, do other research? Where should they look? So to get in touch with me, I'm very easy to find. I'm on Twitter at at Joshua Lennon, or we can connect on LinkedIn. I'm also working with a group called the Global Legal Blockchain Consortium. And this is a nonprofit that's actually creating a legal specific blockchain that law firms, law schools, and legal apps can all build and work with together. And that's a great resource for learning more about how blockchain is going to be a part of the legal ecosystem. And is that particular consortium, is there a website associated with that? Uh, yes, it's the globallegalblockchainconsortium.org. So it's a mouthful. 
It is indeed, but I'm mm -hmm. sure people will be able to find it. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. This is uh, Christopher Anderson, and I look forward to seeing you next month with another guest as we learn more about topics that help us build the law firm business that works for you. Remember, you can subscribe to all the editions of this podcast at LegalTalkNetwork.com or on iTunes. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you again soon. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer. Thanks for listening to the Unbillable Hour, the Law Practice Advisory Podcast. Join us again for the next edition, right here with Legal Talk Network.